Good morning, everybody. I'm author Galen Foley, and today I wanted to talk to you about my passion in life, writing. Now, summer 2019 is the 20 year anniversary of when my second novel came out, and I have a copy of it right here. Princess. Um, this was the middle book of my Ascension trilogy, which consisted of my debut novel, The Pirate Prince. So then we had Princess, that was the middle book. And then the third book in the, trilo in the Ascension trilogy was this guy right here, Prince Charming. And this was about um, a royal family of a fictional Italian island kingdom. Very romantic, very swashbuckling. Uh, just this, the kind of story that I still love writing today. However, when I realized that Princess, I mean, I, may, I had a big celebration last year because it was the 20 year anniversary of my debut novel, but that was 2018. It had come out in uh, summer of 1998, which I cannot even believe, but here we are in 2019 and that was the 20 year anniversary of this book. And when I started thinking about that, I realized that I've been seeing a lot on the internet lately about people having real struggles with second book syndrome. And I thought like I could perhaps add a little bit of advice to you guys that might be helpful as somebody who has really been through the trenches, making my living as a full-time author for 20 years. Um, I have certainly been there, done that and got the t-shirt. So maybe some of my perspectives would be of use to people who are just dealing with their early novels these days and um, encountering all of the fun obstacles that go through a writer's head when they're trying to navigate their second book. So I jotted down some notes. I hope that you don't mind me looking down at them because I'm really not used to doing a lot of videos, but you know, let's be helpful here. I've been at this for a long time and maybe I have some useful things to say. Let's, let's see if I do or not. We'll find out. Um, so what is second book syndrome and what are the causes of it? Second book syndrome is when you have sold your second book or you're just writing your second book and all of a sudden, for no apparent reason, the, ri the writing grinds down to a painful and horrible slog and you hate your life, you hate your book, you hate your editor if you have one, and you just wish that the world would disappear. It is really awful because what you had enjoyed so much when you were writing your first book, it, it becomes just such a pressure cooker that it's really, really difficult to get the second one done. Um, I did some thinking about what the causes of second book syndrome are and I think one of the biggest things, and this is particularly for people that are going the traditional publishing route, but you, you would have sold your first book on a complete manuscript, and that is par for the course. That's the way they want it done. Um, and now, all of a sudden, you, you, had, you might have had years to go over that book and to fine tune it and have critique partners look at it, and then if you had uh, got an agent, the agent probably gave you all sorts of feedback that you had to go in and fix. So you had ages and ages to work on that novel. And now suddenly, this is your first experience of having, you know, once you, you land a contract, you have got a deadline and you don't have forever to get that book done and to make it so, 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 so perfect as you did while you were trying to sell the first one. Um, so all of a sudden you're under this incredible performance pressure and deadline pressure for the first time in your life. Um, as you know, now that you have stepped over the threshold, becoming a professional author, it is a different ball game than being a, a hobbyist or a serious hobbyist. And don't take me wrong. I mean, I, it's so important to maintain that hobbyist love of writing. Um, but this is where, that love takes the first real big hit along with maybe earlier in the process when you're querying and submitting and getting rejected and you feel like you can't do anything right as a writer. Can't write your way out of a paper bag, one of my favorite cliches, if you don't mind me saying so myself. So what else? What is some of the other causes of second book syndrome? Oh, well, one of the causes is your editor. You want so badly to impress this person and make her 
usually a lady, uh, make her think that she has made a good choice of you, picking you out of all the thousands and thousands of hopeful manuscripts that she receives each year. She picked your book, and on the first book, you would have received a certain amount of edits, most likely. The editor would have wanted you to change this, that, and the other. And now, as you're working on the second book, that voice is in your head. So you're trying to anticipate what the editor is going to say so that you can show that you learned something and that you're not going to make the same mistakes. Now, as writers, oftentimes we have our own little pet flaws that we make the same mistakes over and over again. Um, you know, whether, I mean, hopefully we learn with each book that we do, but um, everybody has weak spots and those things will tend to crop up and that's like the first thing that needs to be fixed. So when you're trying to anticipate what other, what the reaction is going to be, what the market is going to do with your book, what the reviewers are going to say, what the editor is going to say, what your agent's going to say, what your mom is going to say, um, you really get in your own way and that's one of the main reasons why the writing bogs down because it's not just you and the story anymore. It's like you and this whole peanut gallery in your head of people chiming in in your own imagination. You're not even there yet. Um, and that, it's awful. It's a terrible thing to do, to have to go through, I mean. And, you know, Lord help you if early reviews on your first book have started coming in already while you're working on the second one because that adds a whole new layer of complexity to what you've got to be dealing with in your head. I mean, if 20 years plus as a full-time author has taught me anything, it's that this entire life is a head game. The life of being an author, I mean. It is a continuous mind game and that, if you can learn how to manage your head and the emotions and the psychology of being a successful author, then you're good to go and you can just focus on the stories and hopefully some of the stuff that I'll be able to tell you today will assist you in that process. So those are the causes of second book syndrome. I think I had one more. Oh yeah. Well, it, it all boils down to just the pressure that you are suddenly under when you go from being a private writer who's just writing their little heart out to suddenly you are in the business. Um, the other thing is that I think we all know if you, if you are exposed to the writing world, you know how important it is to have a strong launch with your first book and how important it is to have some momentum to release that second book in a timely fashion. And it's almost like knowing that, knowing that it needs to be good it needs to be really good. You don't, nobody wants to just end up being a one book wonder. Uh, so it needs to be just as good as the first book. You have to do it quickly and um, you need to do it within the time frame that's going to work for the whole company. You have a whole publishing empire <laughs> uh, in the traditional route waiting, you know, waiting on to enter that new completed manuscript into the process and then the wheels start turning and it goes through the editing and it goes through production and it goes through distribution. There's a whole chain of events that has to happen and if you miss that deadline, then, you know, they're going to have to push your book back sometimes or they're going to have to crash it through the system and just boom, do it as fast as they possibly can and that's how mistakes can oftentimes get made. So nobody wants to have to go through that. Ask me how I know. It has happened to me many times. This is one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you about second book syndrome because I had it so bad. I had it really bad. And I hate to say this, but I didn't just have it for my first trilogy here, but then I released, uh, once I got through this, through uh, the Ascension trilogy, then I started writing um, one of my best known series, which was the Night Miscellany, which is Regency Historicals. And um, it was very, very successful for me. And especially the debut of that series was a big hit. And thus, <laughs> when I came to the second book in that series, I went through second book syndrome all over again because I had, you know, I knew the expectations were high. The reaction to the book among the readers and the reviewers had been awesome. And it, it can freak you out. <laughs> and I also was learning as a, new, a newbie 
that I am the kind of writer that people either love it or hate it. And that's okay. That's actually a good thing. But when it's just you for the longest, you know, for so many years, I was five and a half years just waiting tables at night and writing during the day. And that was my life. I was doing the starving artist thing. So um, I was very insulated. And then once the public exposure started to come in, I, I don't know, it was very tough for me to get used to that. I don't know how people who are, you know, the, the, the internet wasn't really even a thing so much back then. There was no Amazon yet when my first book came out. Now, to have to go to be a new author and launch your, you know, have your book launch, whether you're an indie, if you're launching it yourself, or if it's coming through New York, I don't know how you guys do it. You have to be even tougher than I was, but maybe some of the um, calluses that I've developed in that regard, maybe I have some insight that will help you develop those calluses quicker so that you don't get hurt by it because this this can really it can just really hurt you as a writer and as a person and I don't want to see that happen to you so let me take a quick look here at what my notes have to say <laughs> about the solution so understanding the problems all very well but let's talk about the solutions um, again this really speaks to the um, just the psychology of all this and the psychology is the bedrock, the foundation that you have, you know, techniques are all very well, writing apps, contests, promotion, blah, blah, blah. It's all, it's all important and it's all needed. You need to know about that. But the psychology, if you don't have the psychology right, what are you going to do? You, there's nothing is going to follow out of that. So here is my number one piece of advice. If you're going through second book syndrome or if you're not even there yet, Keep this in the back of your mind for when you get to sec your second book and hopefully it will help you. You really, really need to learn to compartmentalize. You need to compartmentalize your writing. Keep that safe. Keep that like your own little world. And then everything else is off here to the side. The business, the submissions, the editor's opinion, and even the most important people in this whole environment or ecosystem, which is, of course, the readers. You have to, you love them, but you keep them off to the side. And this has to remain protected. This writing, this creativity, that's you. That's your heart. That's your mind. That's your soul. That's your purpose for being on this earth. That's your joy. That's going to nourish you. It's your passion. It's all those things for me. Um, if I'm not writing, I am not like, okay, I'm not normal. I can't even go that long between books because it's just part of, part of what I do. Some people are like that for exercise. Like they need to exercise or they start getting wacky and they get stressed out. I'm like that with writing. And a lot of writers, professionals that I know are the same way. Um, so protect your writing. And I, I would say that you, it would be helpful to almost pretend. I mean, if you're really struggling and you're really feeling that pressure of, oh my God, the whole world is breathing down my neck. Um, even though they're probably really not, it feels like they are. Um, you have to pretend like no one's going to see this. Like you're just writing this for you. Like in the old days, before you got published or before you started publishing your own work, this is just for me. Nobody else is even going to see this. I can do whatever I want on this page. And and ev it's just this mind game that you can play with yourself to make, to make it feel like you can just let go, let the writing come out, let the story come out. It doesn't have to be perfect. Tell yourself that all the time. It doesn't have to be perfect. Of course, you're going to work on it later and get it as polished and as strong um, and as entertaining for people as, it, as you possibly can. But just to get it out, you've got to just play these games with yourself to say, you know, I'm, nobody's going to look at this. This is just for me and I can do whatever I want here and the whole rest of the world that's going to see this further down the line. That doesn't even exist. It doesn't even exist. One of the ways that I would really recommend that you can install this as a way of life is to have two separate computers. Have your writing computer that does not go on the internet where all of the kerfluffle happens. <laughs> and then have, um, have, a, have a computer that is for your business stuff. 
answering your fan letters because they won't always be fans. They will be haters sometimes that will write to you and that's always nice. Um, you know, just dealing with all of the hurly burly, can we say that? We can because we're writers. Um, what else? Oh yeah, just in the vein of taking the pressure off, one of the things I always like to see to tell stressed out writers that I talk to or myself is, hey, this is not rocket science. This is not brain surgery. Nobody's gonna die if this is not a perfect story. I'm not responsible for like being like a fireman and going up and rescuing somebody from a burning building. I, I'm not a surgeon that has to stand there and put somebody's brain back together. <laughs> Thank God. You definitely don't want me as your surgeon. Nobody's life is, is at stake here. Sometimes it's, it feels like the stakes are so high because we want to be successful writers so badly. But by doing that and indulging that thought pattern, you're getting in your own way and you're messing up your own story. So you don't want to do that. Um, what else? Yeah, um, one of the main reasons that I want you to create a safe space for yourself as a writer is because there's so much you cannot control at all in this business that the one thing you can control is your relationship with your writing and um, the joy that you're going to have as it uh, with as a writer, you know, as a creative, the process is the only thing that ultimately you can control. You don't know how it's going to sell and you can't control that. I'm sorry to say there are things you can do, but ultimately, you know, there could be an act of God. Um, funny story. I was getting ready to release, um, my, my publisher had me do back to back novels and that was really, really, really hard for me. I was, I'm not wired to be super fast writer like that, but I kicked my butt really, really hard at the, uh, return of the millennium and wouldn't you know it, I think right when we were going to release the second of the back to back novels, if I'm not, if I'm not remembering this correctly, but guess what happened? 9-11. And the whole entire world went schizophrenic for a while. And it was the end of, you know, it was like the end of the world. And I don't know, fortunately, the book was still a success, but I was in dread, wondering how that was going to go. But anyway, you know, and, and then you think of like, how insignificant you know, you agonize and you make the book, you're writing the center of the world and then something like 9-11 happens and it's like, or, you know, for you kitties <laughs> out there or babies when that happened, um, you know, any major world event, it, a war or, you know, God forbid a mass shooting or a tsunami, there've been so many horrible things. But when these things come along, you have this reaction like, oh, you know, I'm pouring so much of my life and my self into this. What does it matter? What does it really matter in the grand scheme of things? But yet at the same time, you have to remember that this is why we as readers turn to books to help us through scary and difficult and ugly times. It, this is a way to escape and get away from all that into a world of beauty and order where you know, what happens should, what should happen does happen ultimately. The good are rewarded and the bad are punished and it all works out well in the end. Um, at least those are the kinds of books I write where there's always a happily ever after. I can't, I don't want to read a sad book. I don't want to think about a sad book. I don't want to write a sad book. It can have sad parts, but I want happy ending always. And that's why I write romance. But anyway, let me just go ahead on with the rest of my notes and I said that, okay, yes, that uh, you can't control what's going to happen down the line as soon as it leaves your hands. Um, it's beyond your control in so, 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 so many ways. And you're just going to have to get used to that because that is the reality. And if you keep trying to control it, 
then you're just going to drive yourself nuts and burn yourself out. So let it go, let it go. And focus on the joy of the writing process while it is in your hands and then just release it. And I think that's going to be the safest way for you to maintain your energy about, you know, around writing and not get burned out. Um, maintain your enthusiasm. Man, if there's one resource that's even more valuable than time for a writer, it's enthusiasm. And you have to protect that. That's the thing that you, it can get chipped away and it can ebb away from one thing after another. You know, maybe the advance is not as high as you want or the sales are not as good as you wanted. And then maybe this reviewer or this blog site that you really enjoy, they didn't like your book or you know, I, I don't know what it could be. Maybe the, the cover wasn't as good. One little thing after another can chip away your joy. And the next thing you know, you're not that excited about writing anymore. And that is what will kill you. You have to maintain that joy and enthusiasm. And the only way to do that, I'm afraid, at least that I've found, is just to separate these two things. Have it totally compartmentalized. There's the business over here, the business aspects and the public aspects. And then over here is the writing. And this is the book that I would be writing anyway. Even if it didn't sell, even if nobody cared, even if it was just for me, this is the book that I would be writing. Um, and if that's not the case, then I think maybe you should look at what you're writing and if it's really satisfying for you because you can't control all that other stuff down the line. And why would you try? Why would you try to create a product that's just angling at the business when it gives you no personal satisfaction inside? That's really all that you have. I, I know that sounds like an exaggeration, but it's really true. Um, I think it's more true than ever now. But let's see if I had any other little points I wanted to make before I sign off. I think this is getting down to the end of it. So you're going to compartmentalize. You're going to develop an iron stomach because you're going to need it. You're going to have separate writing computer and a internet computer. Do not read your reviews. Hear me now. Listen to me later. Do not read your reviews. Do not scour Goodreads for every comment made about you. Do not Google alerts yourself. Let If you must know all that stuff, I don't see why you'd need to, but whatever. At least filter it through somebody else because you're just channeling all that boop right into your head where you need to have like your pure creativity. But anyway, um, there's no, I just feel like there's only, there's only so much of that awareness of the external world that you can allow in before it starts to compromise um, your joy, your voice, your inner locus of control about where you're going with your art and um if you if you want to if you have to get those ego strokes to know what people are saying about you there's going to be a price to pay down the road i think you should i think you should just put up the walls and insulate yourself but that's just my opinion and there are plenty of people that would probably say the opposite but you know maybe there's just different kinds of people and they're wired a little differently than me and maybe they're just able to tune it out better. But if you're like me and you're not really that able to tune it out, then just put up the big walls to protect yourself. Um, I just wanted to also say what you can do to head this off if you are um, published at this time Here's a, a helpful hint that you could do now that I couldn't do as a baby writer because the internet was just like brand freaking new. I can't even believe that, but that was the case. Um, so here's what, here's what I would suggest. I would suggest that you set up a blog or a Wattpad for yourself and start putting out some pieces of your writing out there for free um, just to let the public start seeing your work because it's really weird when you go from a private writer to a public writer that takes some serious adjustment and I think you do yourself a really big favor if you start putting out some pieces just to get readers looking at it because it's 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 a mindset it's a mindset you you know you will if you if you have people starting to see some of your work now on where there's like 
it's just, you know, there's low danger, there's low scale pressure on you. It's happening at your own pace. There's no expectations. It's not some big audience all of a sudden looking at it. One day, you, when you have that, the pressure and the bigger audience looking at it, you'll have some experience having the public have access to your work. And then it won't mess with your head so badly when you need to come under that deadline pressure and all the other pressures start mounting up. So that would be a really good tip to um, start putting out some pieces now to just start getting used to how it feels to have your work go public. Um, also for unpublished writers, I would develop um, a writing habit that fits with your lifestyle that, that um, has some structure because suppose you suddenly did have a, a publisher deadline on you that was like pretty much ironclad. It, you're just going to be much healthier and better able to deal with it if you have your set, like you know how many, how many pages you can get done each day. It's going to be much more, um, much easier to tell the publisher how quick you can have it done and have a realistic time frame if, if you know, you know, like if you have your set output, you just have your set routine. So have your set routine with writing. Um, it wouldn't hurt to start giving yourself deadlines now because they're under your own control and um, you're going to have them. They're a reality of life. I wish they weren't, but they are. Um, just start giving yourself some deadlines and then putting some work out there like short stories or even vignettes, something small, little by little. <laughs> I would also say be really careful about being a big mouth on social media because, you know, as your, as your profile grows and you have a larger and larger audience and larger platform, the things that you had said in the past could really be scrutinized and eh, why do that to yourself? It's hard enough. It's hard enough to make it as a writer without saying, getting into flame wars and doing stupid stuff like that. So, um, and also, you know, I'm just giving you the real, the real advice here as somebody who's been at this for a very long time. Um, I also would say, you know, really try, I know jealousy is a thing for, for so many people in such a competitive field and try to catch yourself gloating over other people's uh, when other people run into some trouble, like the debut authors that are that are new in your year and, you know, ahead of you that you wish that you were in their shoes, don't gloat over bad stuff that happens to them and, and don't trash anybody's books. That is, that is not a good, that is not good karma right there. That will come back to haunt you, believe me. Oh, good stories I could tell you because then you break into the business and you have to meet those people that you trashed on your Goodreads account or what have you, you know, we're real people and we all know each other pretty much too. So if you trashed one of my good friends and now I have to meet you, I, I could help you within, within the business or I could just not. And I'm like, use your head. It's, it's a old girls network. <laughs> Sorry, but it's true. Okay. Just being honest. What else? Um, Okay, guys, I'm going to close on, oh no, actually I have two more things. Oh, I wanted to advise you to make peace with your day job. Um, I know that's advice nobody wants to hear, but even if you sold your first book tomorrow, it would probably be five years or so before you're even making a decent living. So um, there's so much good to be had by the fact of having a day job. If you're in a business setting, you can learn about you're going to have your own business as a writer. So sink your teeth in and learn whatever you can about running a successful business as an employee. If you're in a service job, like I was, I was a waitress for a really, really long time um, trying to break in. Um, my focus, one of the things that I was better at was just dealing with people. I'm dealing with customers and having fun with people. That's a really important um, element of being in the service industry. And it's a really important element of having a readership. So whatever your day job might be, you could use that. You know, if you're a mom and, and your job is taking care of your kids there, that gives you so many wonderful dimensions to connect with your readership on. Um, that's 
you know, the human experience. Many, many authors share about their kids and their journey as moms, and that is totally valid too. So wherever you are, you know, bloom where you're planted, and it will pay off in the long run. It's, it's not, you know, it's not the easiest life being um, a full-time writer. It's, it can be very isolating, very lonely. Um, it can be, it can be very odd. Nobody else knows what you're going through um, because you're a one person business. So there's no water cooler talk there, you know, there's just, you miss out on a lot. You gain a lot, but you also miss out on a lot. So I just would encourage you to try to be happy with where you are right now, have your goal of what you're aiming for, but be happy in the meanwhile. Don't, don't think I can't be happy until this happens because then you're putting more on it than you think, than it, you know, you, you might be putting more on it than it actually is. I know that sounds crazy to say, but, um, you know, again, there's that thing about it takes so many years to build up and you don't have any guarantees that you're going to, that it's even going to work. I've known tons and tons of writers who've had like one contract and then they didn't get picked up again. So even if you break in, you know what I mean? It's uh, it's not a guarantee that you're going to have a long-term career. Um, and there's a lot of really outstanding writers who still have day jobs or who kept their day jobs because they felt like it gave balance to their lives. There was no shame in it. That's all I'm saying. Um, let us move right along. Okay, so that was another unpopular point that I... <laughs> I'm sure this is going to be a interesting video. Okay, and then um, well, there was one last thing. Oh, yeah. So... Just, just to let you know that it takes a significant amount of time to build up um, a career, and that's normal. It, it's very normal. I mean, it takes a certain number of books, and I mean, the old saw was that it takes five books to establish a career. I don't know if that is still the accurate thing, if it's more now. It wouldn't surprise me if it was seven or ten books at this point, but... Um, <sighs> But even if you even if you quickly wrote, you know, if you're a fast writer and you got ten books written in two or three years, it still would take a certain number of years for the market to get used to seeing your name, seeing your brand out there, um, for you just to get established. There's, you know, there is not just the quantity aspect of having a certain number of titles out before people start to remember who you are, but also just simply time of the titles working their way out through um, through the online publishing world and starting to get word of mouth going. It takes a long time. It still takes a long time. And I, I know that nobody wants to hear that either, but it's true. Um, so if you have that, if you know that, what I've just told you, if you already know that going into all this, then I think that when it comes time for you to write your second book, you're just going to have a more realistic grasp of what all this looks like as you move into a career from a hobbyist into a professional. Um, all of the, you know, a lot of those roadblock, a lot of those roadblocks don't need to be there if you just remember what I told you, um, because it can set the expectation of like, okay, I'm not going to have these incredible, crazy expectations on my debut novel and on my my second book. I'm going to know. There's 10 books, like we'll worry about the 10 books over, or the 15 books over a 15 year, or I'm sorry, um, a five year period. Like look at that scale of things. You might not get that chance with the, the publisher that buys your first book or gives you your first contract. You might, but you might not. But the beauty of it is now that if it doesn't work out, you can still self-publish. You can, you can find another publisher or you can still self-publish. This is the most wonderful time to be a writer. Just don't jump into it too quickly before you're ready. And I think you'll be good to go. So this has been a lot longer than I expected it to be. I had more to say than I thought I did, but I hope that somebody out there finds it useful. And I hope that if you have any struggles with second book syndrome, that you're able to get through it and have a successful book come out. And 
most of them, most importantly, to just hold on to the joy of writing because that is ultimately your main prize. Doesn't matter. If you get a big advance, if you get a wonderful readership, at the end of the day, it was all about you experiencing the story as a creative. And that's, that's where it's at. That's, that's where the main reward is for this job, in my opinion. So food for thought. Thank you very much for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, put them in the comments below and I will see what I can do. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.